Hello friends, this video on molecular basis of inheritance part 5 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So let us understand the double helix structure of DNA in detail. So it is composed of two polynucleotide chains. So the double helix which is formed by the two ribbon like structure, the red one and the blue one, they are nothing but the polynucleotide chains. So we can mark it here. So this one and this one. So what are these two? These are nothing but the polynucleotide chains. So two chains of polynucleotide. Sugar phosphate forms the backbone as I mentioned. So they are basically made up of the sugar that is the pectose sugar and the phosphate group. And these sugar and the phosphate of the multiple nucleotides are joined together by the phosphodiester bond. Nitrogenous bases form the interior paired with hydrogen bonds. So if you see, these are the nitrogenous bases. Let us suppose this is A, again say this is C, let us say this is G, this is T. So this is how we have these. So this is A, Again, this is G and here again you have T, here you have C. So that is how you have the nitrogenous bases. So nitrogenous bases, they form the interior side. So basically they form the stairs of your staircase and they are joined together by hydrogen bonds. So this A and this T, they are joined together by hydrogen bonds. So as I had mentioned before also that the nitrogenous bases present on one chain and the nitrogenous bases present on the other chain, they form, I mean, they form a bond between them and that is how the steps are being formed of the staircase. Complementary base pairing is seen and this is one of the most important proper, uh, property of the structure of DNA. And you can see that this property of DNA plays the most important role uh, behind the fact that DNA plays an important role in the process of inheritance. How that we will see a little later. So complementary base pairing would mean that uh, it is not that any of the bases can map or can bond with any other bases. It has always been seen that A that is adenine will always pair up with Thymine. So adenine will always pair up with thymine and guanine it will always pair up with cytosine. And it is seen that one double bond binds adenine to thymine whereas one triple bond binds guanine to cytosine. So here if you see thymine and cytosine, what are they? These are the pyrimidines. And if you look at A and G, what are they? They are purines. So basically one purine will pair up with one pyrimidine. Now please remember that it is not that any purine can pair up with any pyrimidine. A can never pair up with C. A can only pair up with T. T will pair up with A. Similarly, G will pair up with C and C will pair up with G. And this is known as complementary base pairing. That means A and T, they both act as complement of each other. Similarly, G and C act as complement of each other. So now due to this pairing, due to this kind of complementary base pairing, the process of replication of DNA is very, very easy. Rep what do we mean by replication? That means making, creating a copy of DNA. So that copy creation is easy due to the complementary base pairing. So if we know the sequence of one strand of DNA, then we can determine the sequence of the other strand. For example, if I tell you how are the bases located on this strand, for example, if I say that on the first strand, the bases are located in this order. So what would be the sequence of bases on the next strand? in the other strand or the complementary strand. So of course you can find it out like this. So this would be the sequence of bases on the complementary strand. So complementary base pairing is extremely important feature of the structure of DNA. 
uniform distance is maintained between the two strands of the helix so from starting to the end the entire chain is of the uniform thickness so the stairs are of the same uh, width why is it so that is because if you see properly every time there is one purine which is pairing up with a pyrimidine so purines are all double ring structure and pyrimidines are all single ring structure so when a bond is actually formed between a double ring and a single ring so obviously that doesn't matter whether the double ring is this side or this side or the single ring is this side double ring is this side that doesn't matter but end of the day in all the steps of your staircase everywhere they will occupy the same uh, width so as a result the distance between a and t and the distance between g and c will remain the same and therefore a uniform distance will be maintained between the two strands of the helix something like this 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 is adenine and thymine so adenine and thymine will pair up and again guanine and cytosine will pair up so in both the phase pairing what do you see on one side you have a double ring structure on the other side you have a single ring structure now even if the cytosine would have been present here and the guanine would have been present there but still overall the width the, in that case this side cytosine will occupy little less space as compared to adenine but again that will get compensated on this side where guanine will occupy little more space when compared to thymine now since every time the pairing occurs between one purine and one pyrimidine that is why it is ensured that the distance between the two strands remain the constant throughout the um, helix The two polynucleotide chains have anti-parallel polarity. This is again another important point to be noted. What do we mean by anti-parallel polarity? Let us try to understand this. Now, as I mentioned before, that this has two strain, strands of the polynucleotide. So here you can see that this is one chain. So this one is one chain and this one is the other chain. So let us suppose this is chain one and this is chain two. So these are the two chains which form the two strands of DNA. And here you can see that the bases are joined together by the hydrogen bonds. Right. So here you can see the hydrogen double bond and the single bond. So here you can see the bonds. So now what happens here? What happens to the two chains? So if you look at the free ends of the two chain, here for the first chain you see that this is the 5 prime phosphate end. The phosphate end is always on the 5 prime because the phosphate is located on the 5 prime carbon. So here you see this is the 5 prime end and this is the 3 prime hydroxyl end where you have the free hydroxyl group. But if you look at the other strand, the complementary strand, here you see that the 3 prime hydroxyl end is located this side and the 5 prime phosphate end is located this side. So this is what is meant by antiparallel. That means if one chain is running in this direction, the other chain is running in this direction. So that is its simple meaning. That is the simple meaning of antiparallel anti -parallel polarity. So two chains are running in opposite directions. So how do you know that they are running in opposite direction? Because you have to identify the 5 prime end and the 3 prime end. So whichever end you have the free phosphate, that is the 5 prime end. And whichever end you have the free hydroxyl group, that is the 3 prime end. So here you can see that if one strand is running from 5 prime to 3 prime, the complementary strand will run from 3 prime to 5 prime. So this is also a very important feature of the double helix structure of DNA. So the two chains of polynucleotide are coiled in a right-handed fashion forming a helix. Now when we say that uh, the DNA has a helical structure, so even the helix can be a right-handed helix, it can also be a left-handed helix. So what do we mean by a right-handed and a left-handed helix? So just look at these pictures. Maybe this will help you to understand which is a right-handed helix and which is a left-handed helix. So obviously this is the right-handed helix and this is the left-handed helix. So if you take your right hand, you curl all your fingers except the thumb. So your thumb points in the upward direction and your fingers, they curl in a particular direction, right? Which is anti-clockwise, right? 
So this is the direction in which your fingers curl. So basically it means to say that these two chains will coil around this central axis in this direction. So basically this is the direction in which it will coil. So somewhat like this in this fashion. So this is the fashion where it how it will coil. Similarly if you look at this one. So this will also coil in the same direction. Somewhat like this. So here it, it will start from here, so this direction, again this will also go in this direction because that is, that is the direction in which it is getting coiled, so somewhat like this. So that is how it will keep on coiling, like this. Now the left handed helix again it is just the opposite, so here if you see the direction in which by which it is uh, moving around the central axis that is just the opposite, that is the clockwise direction when it is a left handed helix. So this is the difference between a right handed and a left handed helix, the, the way the two ribbons, so every time I am referring the two strands as two ribbons is because it will be easier for you to understand how two ribbons might coil around the central axis. It can coil in the clockwise direction, it can also coil in the anti-clockwise direction. So depending upon it is coiling in which direction, we say that whether it is a right-handed helix or a left-handed helix. Now as far as the structure of DNA is concerned, it is a right-handed helix. Now whenever we talk about the helical structure, um, a very important parameter to denote the helical structure is the pitch of the helix. And the pitch of the helix in case of DNA is 3.4 nanometer. Now, you, many of you might wonder, what is a pitch of a helix? Well, pitch is nothing but the width of one turn of helix. So, what do you mean by one turn of helix? So, if you see here, just consider any one of the strand. Let us suppose we consider the red strand. So, for the red strand, or if you consider the blue strand, anything is, should be fine. So, let us suppose even for the blue strand, this is how it is turning. So, if you start it from here, by the time it reaches here, it is one turn. Again, when it starts from here, it is the next turn, second turn. Again, when it starts from here, it is the third turn. So, that is how you can say this is first turn, this is, this is second turn, this is third turn and so on. So, when we say pitch, it is nothing but the width of one turn of the helix. So basically this distance, so one particular turn, so this entire distance is going to be the pitch. So one turn in case of DNA, it corresponds to 3.4 nanometer. That means this much is the distance which is covered by one turn of the helix. And there are 10 base pairs in each turn. You base pairs, now you understand what is base pair like A, G, for example, sorry, A, T, G, C. So the pair of bases. So each pair is known as a base pair. So there are 10 base pairs which exist in each turn. So in this much of distance, 10 base pairs exist. So now if I want you to calculate what is the distance between two base pairs. So this is one base pair for example here. This is let us suppose AT, let us suppose this is G and this is C. So if I ask you what would be the distance between these two. This is one base pair, this is another base pair. What is the distance between these two? How will you be able to calculate? Okay, so 3.4 nanometer is the distance which is occupied by 10 base pairs. Right, so 10 base pairs occupy 3.4 nanometers of distance. So one base pair will occupy 3.4 divided by 10 nanometer. So that is equal to 0 0.34 nanometer. This would be the distance between two base pairs. So this distance is going to be 0 0.34 nanometers. So I hope you understood how the structure of a helix actually is. So whenever we talk about helix, we will talk about these terms like pitch. Pitch is nothing but one turn of the helix. Now with these data, we can actually calculate how many total base pairs can exist in one DNA we will see that we will do all those calculations a little later. So this was about the double helix structure. 
So what did we learn about the double helix structure of DNA? Let us quickly summarize. It is composed of two polynucleotide chains and we already discussed what is the polynucleotide chain made up of. It is made up of several units of nucleotides which are bonded together by phosphodiester bonds. Sugar phosphate forms the backbone as I said. The sugar and the phosphate they will form the backbone and what about the nitrogenous bases they form the interior and they exist in pairs and that to complementary pairing and what kind of bond exists between two nitrogenous bases it is hydrogen bonds complementary base, base pairing exists where a pairs up only with t and g pairs up only with c and vice versa is also true that is t pairs up only with a c pairs up only with g Two polynucleotide chains have antiparallel polarity. So if one chain is running from 5 prime to 3 prime direction, then the other chain would run from 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So that is how they are antiparallel in terms of polarity. Two chains are coiled in right-handed fashion forming a helix. So we already discussed what is a right-handed helix. Uniform distance exists between the two strands of helix and what ensures that there is uniform distance between the two strands of helix? It is ensured by the fact that the interior structure is formed by the nitrogenous basis pairing and the pairing always happens between one pudine and one pyrimidine. So the size of a pudine or a pyrimidine always remains the same throughout and therefore the distance between the two strands also remain the same. So the fact that the bonding always happens between one purine and one pyrimidine ensures that the distance between the two strands of the helix is always uniform. Thank you. Please visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos, attempt free online test, get free study material, find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.